gozaimashita. Ladies and gentlemen, this week video we're going to touch on the first listing for this year in the rate market that is Daiwa House Logistic Trust. And it's the 10th listing in the last five years for REITs. Is this something to be excited about or really something to be fearful about? Now, for those of you, ladies and gentlemen, who have been in the REITs market long enough, and we have been in, in the last 32 years, uh, you'll be surprised that this is not the first Japanese REIT listing. The first REIT listing was actually by this company called Saizen. That was way back in November 2007. And guess what happened to it? It said sayonara to the Singapore boss in 2016 because of poor performance. It was actually privatized. So in today's video, we are going to talk about a few things to help you determine the fear factor when it comes to investing or possibly not even investing at all in Daiwa House Logistics Trust when it lists on this particular Friday. Okay, so in today's video, we're gonna to touch on a few things. One is the fact is that how durable is the DPU going forward, right? We're gonna talk about how good is the shareholding structure, look at the asset composition, how really, how resilient it is. Is it as resilient as what the prospectors actually want us to believe? And fourthly, essentially what has passed read these things help us in making a good assessment of whether this IPO is going to be For Daiwa House Logistics Trust, or for, in short, we call it DHC or DHL in this case, right? Okay, so the key thing is, what should we be fearful about? Okay, that's my hair thing, all right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are the few things I want to be covering. So please stay with us to the end because we're going to give you our Christmas present as well, where you can join us essentially for a Christmas exciting event, which I'll share with you details later. But essentially for today's video, we're going to talk about where is the growth in DHL trust? How durable is the DPU going forward? Are investors really buying to diversify read as what they say? And how weak is the shareholding structure really? And what lessons can recent read IPOs teach you as the learned and sagacious read investor? So let's begin. And as usual, once you actually like what we have been dishing out, please subscribe, like, and uh, share our channel and become a subscriber or join us for our classes. Now, first and foremost, this is actually lifted from the perspectives of Daiwa. Okay, you'll notice that essentially, uh, uh, as you look through, okay, you would be surprised on two particular things. One is that, my gosh, the management fee is already high, but there's another layer of management fee that is payable to the Japanese asset management fee. Hmm, isn't that expensive? Okay, secondly, is the fact is that where is the growth, right? Uh, if you're paying higher costs, shouldn't there be greater growth? Because for last year's, the performa, they did 36 million in terms of net profit. For this year, the first half is already 18.4 million. So if you analyze it, analyze it, ladies and gentlemen, it's only 36.8 uh, million compared to 36.1 million. So where is the growth? You know, so that's a key thing that you want to understand first before you do invest or not invest in the stock. Secondly, is that if you look at the balance sheet, you'll be thinking, hmm, maybe I should come by first to relieve my stress. Why? Because if you look at the loans, if you look at the long-term loans, and guess what? There's this item called lease liability. Okay, it's nine one hundred ninety eight million, and it comprises almost twenty percent of the total uh, uh, of the total non current liabilities. But in strict conform to the gearing ratio calculation, this number is not included in the loan ratio. Yeah. The second thing that you need to know is that the perpetual securities are issued at the IPO level, not after. You notice that perpetual securities basically will help to lower the gearing ratio 
So if they are already presenting to you at a gearing ratio of 43% at the IPO level, that's already inclusive of perpetual securities. Think of what the gearing ratio would be if it was not included in at the issuance at the IPO level. Hmm. Once again, come by. Ask, ladies and gentlemen, is how durable is the GPU going forward? You know, because if you read the prospectus, yes, ladies and gentlemen, you see this big star here? Uh, the prospectus is only, only 930 pages. Yeah, so if you spend one hour reading 100 pages, it will take you nine hours, slightly more than nine hours to read the whole prospectus. Okay, so just to save you time, right? Uh, if you notice, most of the retail investors in Singapore just glance through and say, wow, the forecast is 6.5%, slightly higher than the average of the remaining 39 resellers in Singapore. So, you know, maybe worth a look. But if you look further, you realize that, wow, you know, uh, it would such the answers to understand how durable the GPU going forward is, is important. Because in GCP Global, when we actually teach in our class as well, billions in reads, you know, which you can actually get it from all the book stands, as well as actually all the online ladies and gentlemen, you notice that we have always stressed that the durability of a GPU of a read is important. Why? Because number one, it is very difficult to lose money on read. Right? If you actually pick a good read, you would enjoy both capital return plus steady dividend. But one characteristic of not so good reads is that while you still get to enjoy the DPU, the TPU may not be that robust, may not be that stable, which means that the share price will tend to be affected by the stability of the DPU. So let's look at Daiwa's uh, DPU going forward because the first two years, because they need to meet the, uh, the, uh, the boss requirement of a profit forecast, I'm sure the number will come in and meet above expectation. But then again, you know, does it necessarily mean that it will be the case? And for the long-term investors, what lies ahead after the forecast period? That means 2023, 2024, okay? Now let's look none other than the pitch uh, one of the page that they have is on the diversification of its IPO portfolio. So if you look through ladies and gentlemen, you notice that actually there are 14 properties. So wow, seems like well diversified, right? But then again, look further. And look further means that actually out, out of the 14 properties, the bulk of them, that means more than 50% are leasehold properties. What's the meaning of leasehold property, ladies and gentlemen? You know, in, in Singapore, most of the industrial REITs actually have uh, the, uh, have the uh, uh, lease period of 60 years, okay? Most of the leasehold properties in China is 50 years. In Japan, how many years is it? Yeah, you're right. It's not going to be 60, it's not 50, but it's going to be 50, 40 in this case. So what does it mean? It means, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, that potential investors of this particular REIT should be demanding, you know, and this REIT should rightfully be paying a higher dividend yield to compensate for the shorter period, the shorter time period, the shorter lease period of its assets. Okay, so bear that in mind. But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, when I look at this, the valuation, as well as like the NPF of each of the properties, I notice, okay, that if you look at the top four assets they have, Kawasaki, uh, DPL Sendai, Sapporo, Higashi, Kariki, and Koriyama, okay, they add up to about 65% of the portfolio. So actually four properties out of the 14 assets that they have, actually already constitute 65% of the total asset size. So is it therefore proper diversification? Hey, hey, you have the answer therefore, okay? So when I look further, ladies and gentlemen, that means the second, 
third and the fourth biggest property, right? Okay, this is Sendai, Sapporo, and Koryama. Okay, these are their respective costs. These are the respective NPI that they make. And guess what? This is the NPIU. All right. Now, NPIU, hmm, Sendai is 4.5%. Sapporo is 4.5%. Koryama is 3.6%. So what does it mean? Well, this read barely makes more than 4% in terms of NPI. But guess what? In the prospectus, they are and are proposing to pay you 6.5% dividend yield. Huh. You'll be asking, how can this be sustainable when your underlying uh, DPU, D, DPIU, NPIU from your asset base, right? Remember in GCP Global, we teach that a REIT is as good as the assets that they own, right? So essentially, if your asset is yielding 4.5%, and you are paying out at 6.5%, where's the catch? Okay, the catch is most of these properties are actually financed partly by gearing, you know, that is borrowings from the bank, presumably at a lower rate than uh, the NPIU. So when you blend it together with the NPIU, you know, you are able to pay at 6.5%. But then again, ladies and gentlemen, if interest rates do go up, and it is for sure it's going to go up after 2023. Is this REIT actually well buffeted? You know, does it mean that the 6.5% is durable? These are the things, these are the key things that you should be thinking about. Okay. So anyway, just, just to stop shop for a while. Okay. I just want to share with you, ladies and gentlemen, that on the 18th of December, we're going to have this spectacular Lupna Palooza effects of S Week merger and valuation. And guess what? Being a subscriber of my channel, you get to win a free ticket to our Christmas event on 18 of December, where we have the honor of having the CEO and the executive chairman, director of ESR management, that's Mr. Adrian Chu, who will address us on S Week mergers, valuations, and prospects. Okay, so how to qualify for a free ticket? Wow, very easy. Do subscribe, like, and share our YouTube channel, this particular program. You know, then email us when one of your contact or family member becomes a subscriber. Okay, so two steps. One, become a subscriber, like, and share. Two, get one of your family members to actually uh, become a subscriber. Then email us your particulars, your name, contact number, and email so that we can few days before the event. Okay, let me just get back down to DHL. Okay, so the next thing that we have, ladies and gentlemen, is how weak is the shareholding structure of this IPO? Well, ladies and gentlemen, just look at the number of shares to be issued 244 million. In the bulk of them, you know, is going to be placed out to institutions and who are these institutions? You know, insurance company, Credit Suisse, DBS, Nomura. Look further into Credit Suisse, DBS, and Nomura. What does it mean? That it is actually on behalf of many of their private banking clients. So if you look at the top 10 anchor shareholders, do you see a typical institutional fund manager investing in this street? Look through. Well, you may say that maybe DWS investment from Australia, okay? But if you look further, you'll notice that DWS is more a property fund manager as opposed to a typical equities or REIT fund manager. So how strong or how weak is the shareholding structure? Well, you know now, right? And then last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, what lessons can recent REIT IPO teach you? Okay, so that you have a better understanding of where and what and if you should bet, okay, on this particular uh, uh, IPO. Okay, so in this case, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that these are the REITs IPO performance in the last five years. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So Daiwa House coming up to this on this Friday is the 10th IPO in the last five years.
But when you look at the results, ladies and gentlemen, out of the nine that listed in the last five years, what happened? Only two, that is Socio Reed and Land Lease, are able to post positive return. Okay, based on the share prices for all the REITs as of last Friday, compared to their respective IPO prices, right? So this means, ladies and gentlemen, that you know, on an average, right, uh, you could possibly lose a hundred percent, you know, on Eagle Hospitality Trust, you know, which, as you know, you know, who probably is the bank that is actually responsible for bringing it to the IPO, okay? And are they involved in this particular IPO, right? Uh, so look, it's not to put blame, but essentially you as investor need to know, all right? So on the average, you know, in the last, based on last Friday's results, you can see that, you know, nine, seven out of the nine weeks that listed in the last five years, you would still be in the rate. And your average loss because of the 100% loss in Eagle Hospitality is roughly 19%. Now, you would think this is actually a misnomer. You strip it out. Okay? You'll notice that it will still be a loss position, maybe not 19%, but something in the region of a double-digit loss. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Right? Before I say sayonara, be careful, be fearful, know where to look, know where to invest. And once again, like, subscribe to our channel, share with your friends, and basically email us when you have your family member or friends signing up as a member, uh, a subscriber, so that you send a chance to win in our Christmas lottery. Okay, so goodbye and sayonara.